it will feel like trudging yeah. through Mordor day after day with a burden of of loving someone who is difficult to love, right? But our our nature, our biology has has set up this this kind of transformation of of being drawn into the relationship with the bait of sexual desire, and then you're caught on the hook of the covenant that is going to transform you to learn discipline, mm -hmm. to learn asceticism of loving someone else over yourself. Welcome back to Communion and Shalom. This is the third and final part of our conversation with Catherine Moak Wagner, our brilliant friend and medieval literature scholar. In this episode, we talk with Catherine about some of the implications of the quote-unquote peer relationship and how combining or removing certain elements of a marriage relationship can have big impacts for all of us today. If you haven't had a chance to listen to parts one and two, I definitely recommend that. But you can also just jump in. So let's get to it. The pure relationship, you know, it, it sort of, it springs into like full expression as sex is separated from reproduction with mm -hmm. the widespread use of contraception. Sure. But you can see that it has its roots all the way back in like the 11th century, mm -hmm. right? As people start developing the idea of a, a spiritually significant, transcendent, emotional experience, which is radically separate from the pragmatic considerations of running a household. There's an interesting relation. It kind of seems um, Gnostic in a certain way in that, I don't I guess I would say that, but something somehow it abstracts, it focuses on, as you said, like more intangible emotions, attractions, and it divorces itself in some ways from the, in, like the bodily existence of you live together, the children that could emerge from our union, the family connection, the economic household development. And I think I saw someone else kind of trace some of this history through originating in large part or developing maybe in romanticism. And out of that comes this kind of expressive individualism, mm -hmm. trying to form your life around your subjective experience and and finding good life through that. And then in the 20th century, that really does become focused around a lot of like sexual romantic fulfillment in particular. Mm -hmm. And it's... We think about the economic changes in the last thousand years of how we are so economically independent in large part. Yeah, we can be. We can yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, very few people were economically independent for most of history. And now it's the, the few people who are economically dependent, the children, elderly who don't have good retirement accounts, et cetera. And... And so you're just like, oh, is that economic independence a good thing so that we can get this pure love? Our love doesn't have to be entangled with economic realities and just like, well, we're together because we can't afford to move apart. Or, or does that economic keeping the household together because rent would be too expensive separately, is that actually a good binding reality that shows kind of when you're saying like it's it's dangerous to have just one vision of how god's love and god's character might show up in our lives and how we like see it in the created order and and so similarly if we abstract sexual romantic love from these things that god has designed for it to be bound up with he's designed for it to be bound up in household economics he's designed for it to be bound up in procreation and that those aren't barriers but actually kind of flush out the image and that there is no in that way pure being like only one substance of like no pure love is always a, a solution it has multiple compounds that are being mixed together yeah yeah i get that like one one reason why marriage is such a such a good and powerful scriptural image of God's mm -hmm. love for his people is because of the the union right of of these say physical emotional or relational and economic elements right like i i think of i think of sexual desire as as sort of part of this um you know speaking speaking metaphorically a trick that God is playing on us, mm. God and nature, right? The nature gives us this, these, these strong desires, whether it is the experience of limerence, 
of becoming obsessed with another person as a vision of perfection, or if it's literally just being horny, right? Uses these desires to draw us into relationship with another person in which you make promises, like whether you're overwhelmed by limerence or you're, you're bonded together by oxytocin. You know, you make certain promises, you make certain commitments, and then you have to actually live them out over the long term without mm. the force of those strong emotions to make it easy for you. So the, the initial desire to be united with the beautiful is transformed into a covenant of disciplined faithfulness in often very difficult situations involving self-sacrifice. So, so mm -hmm. in a marriage, and, and of course, there's a lot of, of variation and then everybody is an individual, but if we think of the, the typical marriage, <laughs> it begins with eros and it ends in agape. It mm -hmm. begins with a subjective experience of transcendence, right? In which you feel like you've been taken out of your, your own selfishness and become fully oriented to another person on an emotional level, but it ends or it, or it, it leads to an objective transcendence in which you actually have to sacrifice your own interests and your own desires for the good of another, which will feel much less exciting, will feel less like a, a revelation of glory. I, it will feel like trudging yeah. through Mordor a day after day with, mm -hmm. a, with a burden of, of loving someone who is difficult to love, right? But our, our nature, our biology has, has set up this, this kind of transformation of, of being drawn into the, the relationship with the bait of sexual desire. And then you're caught on the hook of the covenant that is going to transform you to learn discipline, mm -hmm. to learn asceticism of loving someone else over yourself. I both completely agree, but have actually like flipped it completely the other way around at times and talking about it in that like Christ initially like draws us in through this agape sacrificial love. We see his great love for us in his sacrifice. He first loved us. And so then we return that love so that we could be united in communion, so that we may know the son, that we may know God and enjoy fellowship with him. Like the, we enter through baptism, dying to ourselves so that we may ongoingly experience communion and participate with Christ. And, and that does, you know, like the death to self that is leaving in a sense, your old allegiances at baptism, burying those in the gravy waters so that you can like enter into new life with Christ does require dying to yourself every day. Like that, that is marriage. That is marriage with God. You continue to, to, we, we have to continue to conform ourselves to this, but it's for like, towards the end of increasing joy and 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 that i've i've often put used eros to encapsulate that increasing joyful communion that like we are moving deeper into eros even if it's totally on the human level and, and i've seen married couples both say like oh yeah we had like our honeymoon phase and, and you kind of like move out of that but then after 40 years of marriage man, am I in love, man, my wife has grown more beautiful every day. And sometimes maybe they're just being poetic and nice. <laughs> yeah. But I think sometimes they believe it. Sometimes they mean it. And even, you know, like, oh, it's 30 years into marriage that couples are having the best sex or something. Because they have they know each other and love each other so much have been so faithful to each other, that that all pours into their sex life. And and practically that they like have had sex a lot and like know how to commune with each other like in in a way that is united and and rich so i i agree like on the natural level it's kind of like i know you're like kind of half jokingly like a trick like it's it's getting you into this thing that's very difficult that's very it needs a lot of it's very binding it needs a lot of both these like external controls of the community and made keeping you to your covenant, as well as the internal bonds, the oxytocin, the falling in love, like to draw you into something that's so difficult and serious. But it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, I have this picture of if there's this large gust of wind that blew you up into the air and you'd be like, I'm flying. And then you'd be like, land back on the ground. And it's that kind of like, oh, that like feeling of flight that you get to to think it's possible to like run the rest of your race but maybe 
you also eventually learn how to fly. And it, and it's it's not just off of a, a gust of wind, but it, it, it does develop into not just a re-experience of that initial burst, but a deeper eros. I'm wondering, is the difference between your perspectives kind of considering what, what using the system, what love God exemplifies most or what love God is like the, the major love of what God is, God is, or what God's trying to do. Cause Gavin, you're talking about moving from Eros to Agape. Did Frank, you're kind of moved, talking about moving from Agape to Eros. And so I, I see you kind of channeling Cunningham and Catherine, I see you channeling more of what I see as the medieval emphasis. I'm just kind of wondering if that's the difference between the two narrations that you have that are, yeah, that are different conversations about what, what love is for and what love is moving towards. Is that, is that a difference? What do you guys think? Yeah, I guess I would, I would come down and, and say, you know, imagine, imagine two different marriages, right? In one marriage, you've got two people who are ecstatically in love with each other. They're having mind-blowingly good sex. They are are enjoying the the fullness of each other's beauty, but they kind of have a, a mental reservation like, oh, if if we ever like didn't love each other this much, it would be cruel to to stay in a relationship with each other. And it would be kind to give each other freedom to pursue love and fulfillment elsewhere. The second relationship, imagine two people who've been married for a while and one of them has become sick and is in a deep state of depression. Let's say she is no longer recognizable as the person that he fell in love with. Totally alien, totally unattractive. Like she can't even shower because she's lying in bed all day. And they have no interests in common. <laughs> they have they don't enjoy spending time in each other's company. And like day after day, he makes her meals and tries to get her to eat them, even though she doesn't want to eat. He takes her to the doctor's office and like forces her to get into the car when she doesn't want to go. And imagine that he is ungracious in doing this, right? He's resentful that he thought he was going to get one thing out of marriage and he has something that is so different, but mm -hmm. he does it day after day. I would say both of these people, both of these couples are images of God, right? They're images of the love between God and his people. Both of them are defective in serious ways. I would say personally that the second couple is a better image of God's love. Hmm. Right? That, that God's love is fundamentally love for the unlovable, right? It's not desire that sees that which is beautiful and desires to enjoy it, to be united with it. It's love that sees that which is unlovable and it sticks to the faithfulness. I, um, I would agree with you. Well... Mm -hmm. I, I might qualify what I'm about to say. If that second couple, if that husband, or whoever the like caretaker is in this, what had, this is a little of my Piper background coming out, was serving with joy and not bitterness in, in their heart. Because God does not delight <laughs> in an uncheerful giver. And so what are, what are all the reasons that he's just like, is it because of societal pressure he doesn't want to be looked down upon as abandoning the person in need i think the service is admirable but the the way you do the service i think is really important the wife will feel his attitude in it yeah and i i agree and and, and, and say like we're mortal we're sinful like of course we're not just gonna be like i'm perfectly happy with my like disappointment life and, and you can like work through bitterness you don't like condemn yourself when like life is difficult and so it makes it hard to say is that th that first couple once they leave each other that's when their failure is but right now they're not they're not actually like expressing their lack of faithfulness to each other <laughs> so that's i feel a little torn in the the mutuality aspect of it like i just think that god wants us to he loves us so that we may love in return and a lot of agape is is unidirectional and and maybe i just need to develop a more mutual agape vision but i think of so much of agape of just like that second story especially if it's a cheerful giver that if the husband is just like the the wife is catatonic basically or something and just just giving himself in love 
so that she may be sustained in life, so she may regain her strength. But it's with the hope that she may receive his love and return herself in love to him. And and I see that like God wants us <laughs> to love him in return. We it is not a fulfillment of the picture. That's that's where I say it like kind of starts with agape. It's always rooted in agape. Christ will bear his scars for eternity as far as kind of I envision so that we always know his sacrificial love and, and communion's an interesting place too that it is like it is re-diving us into his agape every week at the lord's table we are drinking his body and blood which he broke for us and spilled for us but it's unto commute like it is it is both like and maybe this is, i'm overly distinguishing it's them. the marriage supper of the lamb it is the marriage it is the consummation it is the celebration we're together we're one but like it is eros <laughs> and it is agape so i'm that that's why i was the mutuality piece is really big to me. Yeah, and I, I, I said that I think both of these couples are images of God, mm. that being transcendently happy in loving and being loved in return is what God wants for us, right? Like that's an image of, of the bliss of being united to God in heaven. And it's a real image. I guess where what I come back to is that it is a subjective image. It's an image of what it, it feels like to love and be loved. whereas the children that are brought forth out of sexual union and the economic dependence, interdependence of a household, those are actually objective images of what it means to love, right? It doesn't matter how you feel about them, being faithful, being sexually faithful to the person that you've promised to and caring and supporting someone else in sickness, in poverty, in unhappiness. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It is still there. It's still real. And it, and it draws you out of yourself. And I guess that, mm. you know, I think about this partly, you know, like as a woman who has the potential to bear children and as somebody who studies the Middle Ages, fundamentally, I think marriage is for the protection of women and children, right? The domestication of male sexuality, the disciplining of male sexuality so that instead of being a destructive force, that takes advantage of the vulnerable and abandons people to deal with the consequences alone, mm -hmm. right? That that mm -hmm. disciplines a faithfulness to provide for and to protect those who are vulnerable. And to me, yeah. that that's more important than the subjective feelings of love is the the practical acts of love. But definitely, I mean, both are important. And for different people, the emphasis is going to lie in a different place. And, and And like, ideally, especially as you think about those feelings of love, the cuddle, cuddle hormone, the love of hope. Is it a hormone? Oxytocin? Mm -hmm. Is meant for that. It is to be that experienced expression of bonding. And that's what you're talking about. Is this like, is that faithfulness? Is that bonding? Like, I am yours. I'm protecting our kids. Like, I am not leaving you. And so we, hopefully we, we should be seeing the consonance between that subjective, if we call it, but like also very real experience mm -hmm. in our bodies and, and the way that that is supposed to be matching the real lived out experience in the household yeah and i think a, a really good marriage the mar kind of marriage that that people want right unites the subjective and objective elements of this image of god right that's 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 the goal and that's what we should think of as the as the 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 typical marriage, not as the one that happens most frequently, but the one that is the archetype. But in our fallen world, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of defects. Oh, you, you just don't know what's going to happen. And we don't if there's economic troubles in the house, you, you don't give up on. I, I think of like pursuing these three these things in parallel. There was kind of the like sexual romantic, the economic and if, what was oh, and, and procreation of and children, which is part of the household life. But still kind of distinct from just like supporting each other's like cooking and cleaning and making enough money to live. Now, all three of these should be like pursued in parallel, should be intertwined with each other, should be supportive and, and shouldn't be subjugated to each other. Like if I don't get a good sex life, then I should leave be and I drop the other two. And I would actually say that we should, we should say four things, right? I would say that the sexual life and the romantic life 
are different from each other. And it's mm -hmm. important to remember that they're different from each other, that people can have, and for most of history, have had successful, good marriages in which their sexual activity was driven primarily by libido, right? Dri dri primarily mm -hmm. by a physical appetite rather than by a romantic, emotional connection that involves these feelings of devotion. And, and it's, it's, it is illicit to marry in order to have sex because of that physical appetite, right? It's, it's possible for that kind of desire to produce, to produce children, to produce relationships of covenant that that teach you how to love with agape so so i would say romantic love is not is a crucial it's not a necessary ingredient but in in modern marriage we are trying to integrate all four of them yeah. to say that they should be together they shouldn't be separated it, would you say are are any of those four if you were to take it out you'd say oh it's no longer a valid marriage it should get annulled or something i feel like because there's there's i think there's just exceptional situations where like children don't happen for one reason or another their economics might be separated. And this sometimes actually happens in terms of separation. A married couple is like, we can't be in the same house right now. That's not working out. Or maybe if someone gets a job overseas and their households are like essentially independent. Romance, it's not happening. Sex, it's not happening. But n those four components that we ought to intertwine, I don't, they're all like crucial and in a sense essential, but not, you know what I'm getting at? There is one that is that is most essential probably is is the sexual, right? Mm -hmm. Like if sexual two people do not do not consummate with sexual intercourse, then they are not married to each other. Right. So so if two people have have made those public promises, those vows, that covenant, and they live together and combine their finances and whatever emotionally is happening for them, maybe they have a strong romantic bond, but they haven't ever had sexual intercourse. That is is not a full marriage. That is subject to mm -hmm. annulment, right? You can you can ask for annulment and have it dissolved because marriage has not really taken place, right? Because marriage is for sex. Yes, right. It is. It's it's, it's for that act which is capable of producing children, whether it does or not, in order to provide and protect those children. So Jesus says, if. Well, basically illicit grounds for divorce is adultery if you've then like brought sex outside of your marriage mm -hmm. is that only because sex leads to procreation or does sex have some of its own ground in this kind of not romance in the way that we see with dante just kind of like captivated but in the 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 oxytocin bonds that are like happening and sex i, I don't want to divorce it from procreation very much but recognizing, as we especially think about kind of like contraception, uh, homosexual sex, that there's a lot of ways that you could have sex that don't lead to children. And I think that's enabled people to say, oh, maybe I can engage sex without marriage or marriage. I can kind of stay married to this person, but go have sex other places because I'm not going to create procreational complications. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure about this. Paul certainly seems to think, right, that the sexual act makes two people one flesh. He's like, are you going to make yourself one flesh with a prostitute? And I'm mm -hmm. not sure if he is thinking there only of female prostitutes, right? Like, it may be that that he's thinking of the, you know, mm -hmm. the slave boys, right, as well, that that engaging in this type of activity with someone creates a real and a permanent bond that needs to be taken seriously. Certainly we see the that people people are they're biologically bonded to each other. They share their sexual diseases, <laughs> you know, like they they are their bodily fluids are exchanged and and there's a permanent kind of union that, for, that continues after those two two people go their separate ways. I'm not sure if Paul is thinking only of the the procreative possibilities of one flesh union with that prostitute, or if he's also thinking about some of some of this broader kind of permanent connections, like biological connections that are created in sexual acts. So I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna venture a, an answer because I haven't thought deeply about it. But that's helpful, and 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 I think that it like gets at what I was trying to think about. You you were saying, I guess 
I was just wanting to frame it all because you're saying marriage protects women and their vulnerability and, and the children. And, and so that's heavily having in mind both either previous economic situations for women and also the, the procreational reality is that women bear a large burden and obviously children in their dependency like need. And so I completely agree with you that like marriage does those things. So it's, yeah, just this like marriage is for sex, marriage is for the protection of women and children. And of just how those hold together, how those interact is where my question was, kind of, I think, kind of coming from. So we talked about the pure relationship. We've talked about sex and marriage and how they are foundationally connected. We've talked about kind of romance and development, in, especially in the Western context from the 14th century until today. So what do we think is the, like, what are we constructing in our situation as the way forward? And so this is my, like, question of, so we've talked about the either sublimation or transfiguration of, of the sexual desire into what we might say, redirecting it more towards romance slash this divine vision. Mm -hmm. If we, maybe we'll, you, you were kind of talking about breaking Eros into three parts, Catherine, of the, just more explicitly sexual, more romantic, your brain's in a different place. And what was the third one? I said that under the, the general category of mm -hmm. Eros is desire to be united with the beautiful. Mm -hmm. We can see sexual desire is one example. Romantic love, limerence, the falling in love experience as another example. But we also have a very, a very long and, and venerable Christian history of directing desire towards God mm -hmm. in mystic union or a contemplation. So should extramarital limerence be directed anywhere but God. I think that that's kind of the question. Like in marriage, we've like moved to this place of like, oh, okay, we've moved beyond courtly love where limerence is just for your like adulterous relationships. And, but in fact, you should be seeking limerence in marriage or even starting marriage out of a limerick state. And so as you were saying earlier, Catherine, of like, oh yeah, just because you're married doesn't mean you're not going to fall in love with somebody else. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Do you just direct that upwards towards God and say, I found, I saw beauty Lord in your creation. I'm falling in love with it, but I remember that you God are the most beautiful and I, I am enamored by you and learn from our mystic forefathers and foremothers. Mm. Or is it appropriate for like a married person to like, man, I'm falling in love with this other person spouse help me sublimate this to a really wonderful friendship and mm. that that honors god that honors our marriage and and is the spouse gonna be like please like can you just try to fall in love with me <laughs> <laughs> like i'm fine if you like give all your adoration to god because it's gone and so you of course should love god more than me i don't know how to feel about you transfiguring that into just trying to keep that limerence from turning sexual with the other person there there's my there's my setup yeah i think you know it's the the problem of of Gemma donati right that like she doesn't we don't we don't hear her voice what she says is not recorded she dante never writes anything about her we, we know nothing about her really except that she was married to dante she had four children with him it seems at the same time that what dante achieved in transforming his love of Beatrice into one of the greatest poems that has ever been written is, is something magnificent, right? Yeah. It's something that it expresses deep truth. It also seems that he treated Gemma very badly, right? Mm. That, that no one would want to be in her shoes. So I guess that I don't have an answer, right? For people who find themselves in this situation in love with someone who they do not have the possibility of marriage with. I could say that it is possible for that love to be sublimated or transformed in a way that is faithful to, to God's purposes. It is also really, really dangerous, mm. really, really risky because the heart is endlessly deceitful. And because romantic love and sexual desire are 
bound up with each other, right? They're they're using sure. some of the same biological hardware, <laughs> right? From the point of view of evolutionary design, romantic love is for creating unions that will bring forth children, even though it can become confused, right? It can be misdirected in, in evolutionary terms. Like that, mm. that's what it's there for. And so somebody who is, is trying to transform that love, to spiritualize that love is playing with fire. So, so my personal recommendation would be flee from the possibility of, of sexual sin, right? That, that it may, is very likely necessary to put distance from that person right even to to end a friendship or relationship if you think that there is the possibility of falling into sexual sin and unfaithfulness so you don't take down king arthur's court so you don't take down king arthur's court right like the the possible consequences are just really severe but would lancelot have never become the most esteemed knight if he would have just <laughs> yeah, that's the at question. first yeah. notice run from his allurement is there a version where he lets that love ennoble him but properly transfigures that into just pure service to his queen and and, and love and adoration of god you know there is I mean, another interesting thing about the story of lancelot which is sort of endlessly generative it's it's such a such a rich story lancelot has a son sir galahad both lancelot and galahad go on the quest of the grail right to to the the cup that held jesus's blood the wine of the the last supper lancelot is able to see the grail from afar from like outside the door in the room where Jesus himself is celebrating the mass, but he's not able to go in. His sexual sin has barred the way that he, because he's holding on to this love of Guinevere and he, he never really repents of it. He's not able to let go of his adulterous love. He's barred. He cannot achieve the grail. But his son, Galahad, is, he's the pure knight. He is a virgin. He is dedicated to a life of celibacy. He has devoted all of his love, all of his eros, purely to God. He's the one who's able to go in and achieve the grail. So there's this this mystery, right? That like the 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 truly holy love, the love which is capable of being purified and made holy, is in some way the offspring. Some in okay. some way comes out of this this tainted love, this this dangerous and destructive love that that breaks the the bond of loyalty. It's a mystery. Um, <laughs> I would say my my advice. As a private individual, just prudentially, is flee from the occasion of temptation. Mm -hmm. And yet, I know that that people find themselves, you know, in situations where they are trying diligently to to suppress the the feelings of romantic love, the feelings of sexual desire that they're experiencing. They're trying their their very best to discipline those feelings, and they are not able to. And so then the situation becomes well. Given that this is not going away, how do I sublimate it? How do I transform it? Mm -hmm. But I, I would, I would, I would recommend <laughs> trying very hard on the first step of can I flee from this occasion of temptation? Can I put to death this desire which is potentially sinful as the first step? And if you find yourself in a situation where it, it seems that you can't do that, then there's the the more the more dangerous, the more complicated task of of trying to transform it but again this is i do not speak as an expert and i don't presume that i have the the right or the wisdom to advise people in those very difficult situations i think we hope well we hope you continue to be a like a friendly reflective thinker who will join the conversation because i think this conversation will continue at least in the side b community about what are the possibilities mm -hmm. and I will say that the the flee the categorizing them predominantly through like a like flee from these things is understood, but also seems sometimes ineffic like insufficient as you're kind of alluding to. Like it can't seem to it can create like cultures of like the Billy Graham rule where like yeah anyone's experience of this 
greater eros of just beauty <laughs> like becomes like oh no that could be limerence that could be sexual temptation could be <laughs> emotional affair yeah 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 which is hostile to deep friendship if you're always worried about is, being yeah. in an emotional affair and yet there are there is such a thing as an emotional affair right yeah like, there, there is, is such danger, a thing yeah. as 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 a as a relationship that is unkind to a spouse uh, and you brought up like oxytocin in all its, its usages mm -hmm. and of breastfeeding as, as being a significant one that like some of the maybe transfiguration is also a like seeking some of that when there's a desire for connection of like try singing together, <laughs> like find spiritual communion and communal solidarity that maybe it'll just exacerbate the longings, but is not just this kind of zero sum game. Mm -hmm. I, I to me that's like part of it. it's not just like oh you, you want to get to know this person but it could be inappropriate just ignore them of like oh, what are the appropriate ways to get to know them because mm -hmm. we all this underneath a lot of this is the longing to be known to be had to mm -hmm. there is i think the special part of eros is this like transcended into the beautiful but just the deeply personal part is is to yeah to be connected to be known Mm -hmm. And and so I think there's really good ways we can just be seeking that. Yeah, and I this you may take this out because I think it's a side point, and I wish that I'd said it earlier. But like the, I'm just I'm thinking about the the stories that come out. It feels like every week of, especially men in power who abuse their positions of authority and trust to take advantage of people. And and that's that's the context of what I'm saying, like flee from sin. That like the Billy Graham rule is maybe not a bad idea in a world of Robbie Zacharias, in a world where there are seven hundred suspected or confirmed sexual abusers in the Southern Baptist Convention. Right? That this it really, it really every day, thousands of people tear apart their families, destroy their own lives, their reputations over sexual desire throughout the church, not just Catholics with celibate priests, but throughout the church, we're seeing more and more people abuse positions of spiritual authority to take advantage of those who trust them as their their spiritual directors, their confessors, their shepherds. And that's that's the context in which I say that like the human heart is endlessly deceitful. And yeah. if it's possible for, it is possible, I think, for for sexual desire to be redeemed, to to bring forth spiritual fruit in in deep and intimate friendships, but just looking at the state of the fallen world, it is much more likely, right, for it to lead to to the uh, the the abuse and exploitation of the vulnerable, right? I, like, I, and then we always have to be aware of that danger. Yeah, I, I like real briefly. I think three things. One, some of that, I think there's appropriate to wonder in Southern Baptist Convention, what part of that is purity culture creates a a toxic relationship to sexual desire that then like promotes this like secrecy and like kind of exploding up from the side to the Billy Graham rule makes more sense in these positions of power, which is where we've seen a lot of this the Southern Baptist Convention stuff is like, these are people who have spiritual and community leadership. And that power not only was abused, but you just have more power to abuse. And I think that there are, yeah, just like you said, Catherine, just a higher demand to just like run from not just sexual temptation, but recognizing that run from situations where you may be abusing your power through your sexual temptation and all the more hurting other people. Hmm. And then the last note that the foregoing of of desire and the like surrendering that to God, I think has been for me at some of the points where I have the most like tangible experience of God's peace and love is not in the trying to like pursue it earthly and like find God through it, but it, it is surrendering and, and saying like, I want to desire you, God. And I, or I trust that you will satisfy me. Even if right now I feel so much in want. So the, I, I think it can be difficult to sometimes 
maybe we want to like have our cake and eat it too. Like, oh, I'm going to transfigure my desire, but also be completely satisfied in its earthly expression. And even in the most beautiful human marriages, a husband and a wife will still fall short of the love of God and us being able to know it. And so I think even in those situations, there has to be a sort of surrender that like my deepest wants and desires, even if we cultivate that in beautiful ways in this marriage that glorify God and point to him, still I'm left yearning for the infinite and, and God wants to meet us in that yearning. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, this goes back to the wisdom of the the ancient church in in saying that it is a special, there's a special closeness to God reserved for those who are celibate, right? That in saying no, in putting to death desire, desire can be redirected and transformed and in its quality. And it's almost, I mean, it's like, it's a little bit like fasting, like part of, part of what you're doing when you're fasting, or at least part of what I'm thinking when I'm fasting is like, like this physical sensation of, I can't stop thinking about what I'm going to eat, you know, when I, uh, you know, tomorrow when I'm allowed to eat and like, I feel crazy, you know, like, like my, I like my emotional volatility is up. I'm having an ex existential crisis and I know that it's literally just because it's 3 p.m. and I haven't eaten anything today, <laughs> right? Like it's, it's just like revealing, like, this is how much I should desire you, God, you know, and that's like a little bit because it's like for mm -hmm. a very short time living a life of, of celibacy, right, is, is, is that magnified times a hundred of like this yearning, like this degree of desire, that's how much or more I should desire you, God, God, transform my desire for this into desire for that. Right. So, so that's, so, and, and for somebody who can have that desire satisfied, they, they almost, they know less about it. Like the celibate person in a sense, like has, has more of a, a full and understanding of sexual desire because they have resisted it more and more, right? Mm -hmm. They know how strong mm -hmm. it can be because it's not being satisfied. The married person is, it's easier to stop on the level of being satisfied. But I think, David, as, as you say, that the married person can see in sex and image of God to the extent that they aren't satisfied with their marital relationship. Right to the extent that it falls short, and they recognize this is not enough. It's a little speculative. No, I, I yeah, I think it's both. Like, yeah, as we eat delicious food, we are like, you taste the goodness of God, and then, and then when it's like, man, I want to keep eating even more delicious food, it can it shows our our hearts for the the transcendent and divine. And I. Have you, in fasting, have you experienced that, like, that turn from, like, just, like, oh, man, I'm so hungry, I want food right now, and in prayer, that that hunger is able to shift, and, and you're able to, like, in a sense, like, quell your appetite, or not just quell your appetite, but receive that satisfaction, receive a fuller satisfaction from God? I would say yes, but over time. Maybe after the first week or something. <laughs> yeah. I'm so curious, what do we think in general? What's a constructive way forward for us thinking about it as Christians in our contexts? About how to deal with these realities of the peer relationship and what how that's emerging in our con some of our contexts versus older views of marriage. I'm still curious of this evaluation of this romantic perspective which became dominant. I thought I think you you seem fairly like, yeah, it's it's good it's better than some of the alternatives that have been an offer but yeah but how do we deal with these things like what's kind of the way forward or the evaluation we have of sort of where we find ourselves in relationship to marriage and celibacy and kind of the peer relationship yeah i think that the christian witness in these times has to be just just stressing so strongly that we are embodied beings right we are mm -hmm. rational animals and i think that the pure relationship we've we've brought up the term gnostic you know and i think that in a, in a weird way like our cultures our culture is obsessed with sexuality and it, it is sex positive and sort of glorifying bodily pleasure bodily desire and yet in a in another way it is it's really hostile to the reality and the significance of the body mm -hmm. right 
that that even even as sexual pleasure is celebrated, we want to separate that out and sort of spiritualize it as purely an emotional experience and separate the the gritty, you know, the the tangible, the pragmatic considerations of like, what does this mean for my finances? <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Like, what about the the diseases that are being spread through this like we really don't want to deal with the biology even as we celebrate a kind of spiritualized body right and to say like we are embodied creatures our natural design is good we're physical we're biological we are we are evolutionary we are designed to reproduce ourselves and the the spiritual meaning of our our emotional and subjective life can't be wholly cut off and separated from those those incarnate those those sacramental natural substrates that support that that spiritual significance right like mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. we cannot separate them out it's it's we have to respect ourselves as rational animals in our animality and so that's that's the note that that i would strike in in response to the pure relationship is is one just like philosophically theologically we have to reckon with our the reality of our embodiment and then the other note which i think that our culture is maybe maybe more able to hear is that reckoning with the reality of our embodiment is especially important for caring for the vulnerable right that it is women who get hurt, right? When we pretend that you can have sex without strings attached, because it is men have always mm. been able to walk away from sexual pleasure without consequences, right? In the ancient world, they had slaves for that purpose. Other people are not able to walk away, um, and yeah. we have to have those people at the center of our sexual ethics. And, and rather than seeing those as like incidental obstacles to overcome, in order to like seek this pure desire pure love that yeah that the the holiness the manifest revelation of god in every facet of our embodiedness that the entire family structure that god wants to have those be revelations of him he wants us to know him as father so there needs to be fathers in a family he, jesus wants to know us as brother and so, like, we should have siblings in the family. And if we try to abstract ourselves from the natural relationships that just come about because of the ways that it means to be embodied, then all of these parts are embedded with with meaning and purpose and not to be utilized towards just the end of reaching pure desire, but are all very purposeful and meaningful and worthy of protecting like in how we create the systems and culture of our society is that a i'm i'm probably just trying to like say what you're saying a little differently yeah and i I mean we can we can think about i mean in plato's ladder like you kick away the lower rungs like the bodily is not really important except as it's like a little glimpse of the things that are more important. But in Christianity, Jesus comes all the way down and he sanctifies mm-hmm. our our bodies in his birth as a helpless infant, in his crucifixion as a helpless condemned criminal. And he he takes all of that up with him. He takes his scars into heaven. And so there's like a, a Christian ethic, but there's also like a Christian aesthetic sensibility that mm-hmm. supports that ethic. And so if you just are saying, yeah. here are the rules, people will feel that as a, as a as an imposition if they have bought into the the aesthetic of the autonomous self yes. of, of expressive individualism. And so we have to have an appreciation and a love on an emotional level and on an aesthetic level for the goodness of nature <laughs> as God made it, the goodness of our bodies in their their messiness and their the ways that they make us weak or out of control to say that those things are are loved by God and that they are not going to be left behind, right? That our our rational minds can't just pursue pleasure. They have to take into account what it means to be a body, how we are Mm. designed as rational animals. Catherine, if you were to point people 
towards a piece of literature to help shape that imagined vision, that aesthetic vision mm-hmm. of of God's beauty and its family or sex or romance. Well, what might you point people towards? I think I would recommend that you read Kristen Laveran's Daughter, which is a, a 20th century novel set in 14th century medieval Europe. And it, it follows the life of this one woman, Kristen, through her her early days being educated at a convent, through her, through her marriage and her bearing of, I think, 10 or 11 different children. And it is, it's a... It's long, so it's hard to recommend because I know that not everybody will have the time to to get through it. But it is a really profound meditation, I think, on the nature of love, the meaning of marriage, the what it means to be a woman and, and the suffering that comes with being dependent on others, a husband who is initially attractive, but turns out to be be imprudent, right, in ways that have have really painful consequences. For Kristen and her children, the the pain of childbearing, the risk of death, which has been the the normal way of married life for mm-hmm. most women, right? And then the ways that that God's love is woven through those earthly loves, the ways that that Kristen can be transformed, not all at once, not in a in a triumphant achievement, but but more and less at different times, in different ways, in different situations being led towards self-sacrificial love, being led towards desire for God himself in and through these earthly matters of the the running of a household, the the bearing of children. I I really love this novel and I think <laughs> that it's really wise. Thank you. Yeah. And it's it is antithetical to easy answers. It is really mm-hmm. a novel in which you have to live with the complexity and the difficulty of these matters. It's good. Yeah. Thanks okay. so much, Catherine. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. We appreciate all your wisdom and insight. <laughs> Hope we can talk with you again someday. So, and thanks everyone for all of our listeners. So happy you joined us again. And we hope you keep listening. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for joining us. We would love to hear your thoughts, pushback, questions after listening to this conversation. So send us an email at the links in the description or find us on Instagram. Peace. Hey listeners, I want to let you know about the Communion and Shalom Patreon. Joining the Patreon community not only supports this podcast, but gives you the opportunity to listen to bonus content, give input on future episodes, and submit questions for a patron-only Q&A. We are so thankful for the support and encouragement from so many listeners, and we hope that this podcast continues to be meaningful to you.